What Was That Like? contains adult language and content and is not intended for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Are you nervous to go to prison? Are you scared? Like, what are you afraid of about this? What do you think it's going to be like? What if somebody tries to come at you? What are you going to do? Welcome to What Was That Like? I'm your host, Scott Johnson. This is the show where we talk to regular people, people just like you or just like me, who have found themselves in an extremely unusual situation. We'll hear their stories and get inside their head because we all want to know, what was that like? More information about each episode at whatwasthatlike.com. Here we go. There was a time in his life when Dan was in a pretty difficult situation. He was facing something that most people don't ever have to go through. Even though he was not a violent person, and he certainly was not any kind of career criminal, he made a bad decision and accepted a job that, looking back, he never should have taken. But he did. And that led him to the tough spot he found himself in. Dan was headed to prison. His plea deal meant that he could get up to 60 months, five years of his life. One of the things he found to be the most stressful was that he had no idea what to expect. So just before he was actually sentenced, he recorded a YouTube video, kind of an audio letter to his friends and family. I just want to let everybody know, um, I am going to probably be going to federal prison uh, next week, actually. Uh, the 30th is when I get sentenced. He was just reaching out for help, any kind of information that might be of some benefit. So I just kind of wanted to ask if anybody out there has any idea of what to expect. I've been dealing with this for about three years right now, in case you're wondering how I'm smiling about at this point. I'm just uh, ready for this to be over. I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm just looking for some advice how to deal with uh, federal prison. What I did was wrong. Um, regret it. He kind of didn't really know what to ask for or who he could talk to to help him out. His lawyer couldn't even answer these questions. So if any of you can give me advice of, of uh, what I should do while I'm in there, things to pass my time, any recommendations of a of a federal prison camp, work camp, that you can recommend. I'm just looking to make time go by as fast as possible. Dan made that video in 2014. Now we fast forward to today, and Dan is at a very different place in his life, a much better, happier place. He runs a very successful business working as a prison consultant. When nonviolent first-time offenders are suddenly faced with the fact that they're going to do time in prison, they are desperate for answers and guidance. What to expect, how to prepare, how to get your time reduced, how to interact with the other inmates. Dan helps them with all of that. In our conversation, Dan told me about his own experience, what he did that earned him that prison time, what his first day was like, which is actually a pretty hilarious story in itself, and how he shortened his own time. And he told me how he helps people today. Imagine if you've never even been arrested before, but you make a stupid decision, or you drive drunk and kill someone or whatever, and you're headed to prison. Dan knows exactly how you feel, and he has the answers you're looking for. And if you want to hear more from Dan, you have to check out his YouTube channel, he has literally hundreds of videos that he's created all around this topic. I'll have the link to that and his other social media accounts in the show notes, or you can just search YouTube for RDAP Dan. That's R-D-A-P Dan. And you'll find out what that stands for in just a few minutes. And a warning up front, you already know on this podcast, I don't bleep any words. And this episode in particular has a lot of those words. I mean, we're talking about prison here. So if that offends you, you might want to skip this one. So here's my conversation with Dan. Considering where you are today and what you do, do you consider your own 
prison experience to be a positive thing? Uh, 100%. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> that is weird. <laughs> it's, it's a question I get quite often. And I really feel that if I hadn't had my prison experience and had a different approach and different view on what I thought things would have been like, I would probably be in a much different place today. Well, let's talk about what happened to you. How did you end up being sentenced to prison? And how long ago was that? When did that happen? So I caught my case in 2011 is when the investigation started. I was indicted on my case in 2013, and I started my prison sentence in 2014. You know, it's you look back and you kind of wonder in life, like you wake up one day and you ask yourself, like, how the fuck did I get here? And it, it was really from a series of bad choices from always looking for shortcuts in life, not really wanting to put in the proper amount of work and effort that was required. Uh, living in South Florida, everybody had nice cars, nice houses, boats, you know, spending tons of money going out to clubs. And I wanted these things as much as anybody else did. I just wasn't always willing to put in the amount of work and effort that was required to earn them the right way. So I just continually looked for shortcuts. And each time I took a shortcut, a little bit more of humanity would kind of disappear. And it got to a point where I was making such poor decisions, but justifying it. And in my mind, it was like, oh, you know, I have to do this to afford to live here. I have to do this for my kids. And I started working at an office in Boca Raton. Uh, we were doing credit restoration, which was fine. Wasn't really making any money doing it. It was a small business that I had started renting office space in another guy's office, this guy named Sean, Sean and Lou. And they had a call center doing something else, magazine sales or some other shady South Florida get rich quick scam. It seems like the South Florida is like the like a mecca for that kind of thing, right? Yeah, you know the days are sunny and the people are shady. It's uh, it's it's the way South Florida <laughs> breeds us. I you know I, I blame Florida for all of my problems. But no, there you really, go. All right, now we know. Yeah, really, these guys they were talking about opening up a a pain clinic or a doctor's office in Savannah, Georgia. We were in Boca at the time, and I had no idea what a pain clinic was. I just kept hearing about all the money that they were going to make doing it. You know, they're talking about millions of dollars in generated revenue, and I'm just thinking, how can I? How can I plant myself in there? How can I become involved to get a piece of whatever it is they're talking about doing? And sure enough, they, you know, they saw my enthusiasm in it and told me all the things I wanted to hear, which was, we'll, we'll pay you $10,000 a month. You can bring your fiance with you. You can hire your best friend. So you can pretty much take your, your Florida life and bring it over here to Savannah, Georgia. You'll open up these doctor's office for us. You'll manage the office. And the question I had was, well, how do I manage a doctor's office? I've never worked in a doctor's office before. Well, we'll train you. We have staff. We have nurses that will train you. There's going to be a doctor on site that's going to be treating these people for you know, pain management. You just need to make sure the office stays in order. People aren't getting out of line. We'll train you in what you need to know. Your girlfriend can answer the phones. Your best friend can do triage, which is basically the guy that watches you pee in a cup. Um, so he had probably the shitty end of the stick, which is probably why he doesn't talk to me to this day. I don't know, but, uh, it was, you know, I jumped into it and people were coming from all over the place, coming from Kentucky and Ohio down to see our doctor. It was very clear that they were just doctor shopping. They were coming there because they knew they could pay a fee and they were in the hopes of this doctor would just write them a, a prescription for whatever they wanted. And I, that was the case in some instances, uh, there were cases that the doctor turned away people, but all in all, it was a pill mill. People were were getting their prescription drugs. We were legalized drug dealers that found a way to do it through the scope of the law, at least thought we were. Weren't open very long. Feds came in, raided us, and uh, that was a wrap, man. It was once they kicked in the doors and came into our houses at you know five or six in the morning, had guns on us, guns on our dogs. Uh, you would have thought it was going after Escobar or something. It was, it was something right out of a movie. Um, never imagined being in a situation like that ever. I was terrified. You had a doctor, you were writing, they were writing prescriptions. What was it that made this illegal? We saw what other pain clinics were doing. So we kind of thought what we needed to do to avoid getting in trouble. We saw a lot of these doctors that basically 
would see people whether they had issues or not. You came in there with a fake MRI or you just basically walked in with cash. The doctor would give you a prescription for anything you wanted in a lot of these other places. So we specifically were not doing that. Uh, we were verifying MRIs. We were making sure they weren't Photoshopped. And we did our best to make sure people weren't doctor shopping. But when the feds came in, they basically said, this is an illegit practice. You know, these people are drug seeking individuals and you're turning a blind eye. I really, to this day, don't think that was the case. Um, granted, morally, you could tell these people were were addicted to drugs. I mean, they were dry. Who drives from Kentucky to Georgia to get a prescription? I mean, that's a little bit insane. They would come down in car loads. There would be one car, a minivan would pull up and it was like, you know, 44 people would crawl out of the minivan and one guy would come in and pay for everybody. And those are called sponsors, you know, and the sponsor would pay for everybody's visit when they would get their prescription, whatever their pill count was. Let's say they got up. Most of these people were seeking either oxycodone, Percocets, some sort of a schedule two narcotic. And whatever the amount they would get, let's say they get 30 pills per prescription, they would take half of their pill count and give it to the sponsor that paid for them. Because insurance, if you have insurance or you're going to a pharmacy, you're, you know, you're getting these pills for a pretty low price, especially if you have insurance, it might not cost you anything except the copay. And then the street value on these pills was at one point, depending where you live, you might get $20, $30 a pill got, you know, now this drug dealers got, you know, a thousand pills from all the people that he sponsored. Uh, It's, it's serious money for uh, very little work, but uh, it's putting drugs out onto the street and kids are getting these parents are getting these it's ruining lives. Uh, These are things that I chose not to pay attention to at the time because I was blinded by the potential money that uh, I could have made that I never made by the way, but that I thought I was going to make. And and I'm sure it's easy to convince yourself that, well, yeah, it is legitimate. We have a real doctor. These are real prescriptions and you know, yeah, maybe they're, the people are a little shady, but you know, hopefully it's not, you know, I'm not going to go to jail for it, of course. Yeah. You know, you justify these thoughts just like you'll justify anything. Uh, maybe you own a liquor store and you're like, well, you know, the guy is 21 years old. He's coming in to buy alcohol. It's not my fault if he drinks the bottle, gets behind the wheel. Uh, and you can justify that with almost anything. So granted, we knew these people were driving from from a faraway land to come see us. But in the state of Georgia, there was no law prohibiting that from happening. People could drive from anywhere and they had MRIs. They had uh, verifiable issues that they could show that they've been getting prescriptions for an ongoing amount of time. So the doctor could, you know, easily turn a blind eye and say, well, even though I suspect, and especially for me, for the office manager, or other people working there, I was just thinking, well, shit, it's, that's all in the doctor. If the doctor's writing bogus prescriptions, you know, I just work here never in a million years did I ever think I thought we might get shut down or, you know, maybe bad reviews or, you know, I never thought the feds would come kick in my door and I would end up getting sentenced to prison. That never crossed my mind. I watched one of your, maybe it was your very first video, July, 2014. And you were kind of announcing to your friends and family, Hey, I just want to let you guys all know I'm going to be going to prison. And it seems so ironic that it, you then, I mean, you were the person who comes to you now um, <laughs> wanting to find out if you guys have any, I mean, you said it right in the video, if you guys have any advice, you know, what can I do? Or, you know, you were just, I mean, you seemed really, obviously, you know, you're going to about to be sentenced to prison. It's a pretty depressing time. Do you remember making that video? What your, what your mindset was then? Yeah, I do. Um, I don't know why I made the video. I don't know what made me because it wasn't like I had any intentions of starting a YouTube channel. That was the last thing on my mind. I'm not sure what made me do the video, but I remember very vividly what would go through my mind on a day to day basis. And and this also really complements. You hear a lot of people out there say, oh, these white collar guys don't get rough enough sentences or these minimal guys that are only getting minimum time in a in a low security prison or some type of a club fed environment. What they don't know, and it's real easy looking in from from the outside when you when you live in this you know fantasy world where it's easy to judge others. What you don't understand uh, is the the torment that you go through from the time that you find out you're in trouble till the time you actually end up going to prison. For most nonviolent first time offenders, I don't want to label white collar. 
because it could be low level, low level drug dealers as well. So nonviolent first time offenders, you typically are out on pretrial when it's a federal crime the entire time. And these cases can go anywhere from several months to a couple of years. Your expectation of what you think prison is going to be like is probably every fucking crazy TV show you've ever seen where dropping the soap, getting shanked, getting extorted, getting turned out, all of those fears, taking showers in these horrible settings where there's just a bunch of you know naked people running around or you've got to survive. This is what you imagine prison being like. So the entire time you're prepping to go, you don't really know what to ask. And your friends and your family, they're useless. They have the best of intentions, but it's almost like if you ever had a family member that's dying of cancer or dying of some type of a terminal illness, part of you is like, just hurry up and die because I can't do anything to stop this. I feel horrible you're going through this, but it's literally like watching somebody die. So my friends and family would tell me, oh, the judge is going to see you're a good guy. Oh, he's not going to sentence you to prison. Only murderers and rapists and you know child killers go to prison. Uh, you're a decent person, Dan, but my attorney's telling me otherwise, not giving me the full scoop of what I'm, what's entailed, but just like, no, you're going to prison. It's part of your plea deal. So you have all of this. It's it's so unresolved in your mind because all you can imagine is your biggest fear coming true, being take, t- tore away from your family. What do you tell your kids? These are all the the things that would go through. So I think when I turned to YouTube and made that video, I think it was because I was so sick and tired I I didn't want to complain to anybody. I didn't want to go get sympathy. I wasn't looking for somebody to go, oh, it's going to be okay. I wanted somebody to go, man, that's fucked up. Are you nervous to go to prison? Are you scared? Like, what are you afraid of about this? What do you think it's going to be like? What if somebody tries to come at you? What are you going to do? Those are the things that I was thinking about. And I could not find those answers for the life of me uh, because it didn't exist. There was no real outlet to ask these questions. Right. And who would you ask that from? I mean, your friends and family, none of them had done serious prison time, even though they're giving you advice about it, you know? So yeah, I think I had a couple of buddies that spent like overnight in a drunk tank. That was about it. (laughs) So yeah. And you were looking at some serious time. So what happened with, with your sentencing? I originally, they offered me a plea deal, a a pre plea deal. So they offered me a plea prior to, to being indicted. So pre-indictment, they offered me, hey, take a plea. We won't even indict you. We'll just indict you on information. So when I said, okay, what's that look like? And when they told me, well, we'll, we'll cap your sentence at, at 60 months. And I was like, 60 months probation, 60 months home confinement. And the, uh, the US attorney said, no, no, no. We're going to cap it at 60 months prison time. I was like, wait a minute, prison time? I'm actually looking at prison time? He goes, yeah, but, but the worst case scenario will be 60 months. I was like, I don't give a flying fuck if it's six months. I, I'm I'm not going to prison. I don't know how to handle myself in prison. I have small hands. I might drop the soap like every other fucking day on accident. People are going to think it's like an intentional, an intentional uh, signal or something. So I was terrified. So I immediately turned down that plea deal. And when I turned down the plea deal, the government unloaded every weapon they had. They went from going, hey, bud, how's it going to you little cocksucker, we're going to squash you like a cockroach. You don't know what you just did because I I dragged it on for a year thinking I'm going to plead out because they kept telling me, oh, we're going to work with you. We're going to give you this great deal. Just cooperate, cooperate. And I'm like, okay, do, 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 walking blindly. And my attorney, like most criminal defense attorneys, they, they oversell, under deliver. You're expecting this attorney to ride in on this giant white horse that's going to like slay the demons being the federal government. And really, what 99% of criminal defense attorneys do, unless you're going to trial, what 99% of them do is they're they're a fucking talking head that gets the plea deal from the government and sells it to you. They literally pitch it to you like they're a car salesman selling you a car that you know you shouldn't be getting into. And they tell you, this is the best it's going to get. This is a good plea deal. Just take it. And I'm like, well, what's good about it? I'm going to prison. Like, isn't there, can't we fight this? And he's like, ah, if you fight it, they're going to come at you. I was looking at potentially 25 to plus years in prison uh, if I had not taken a plea deal. So when that reality kicks in and you start to really weigh out your options and the reality sets and you're like, well, shit, 25 years I can't do. I'm going to be an old man. My kids are going to be grown. My kids will have kids. 60 months, worst case scenario. Okay. 
some little good, good time in there. Maybe if you get lucky and get some other time off, you know, there's other ways you can manipulate that. All right, three and a half, four years, I'll still have a life left. And you start to swallow that and you just look at this, you know, this shitty option and it becomes your best option. So you you suck it up and suck the government's, you know what, and you take the plea deal. Yeah, and I can see where it would take time for your brain to process that, wow, this really is the best I'm going to get. So, but you, you ended up, you didn't do the full 60 months, right? When, how, how long were you in? No, no. So, so I ended up, uh, the judge, so my cap was 60. Um, the government said at my sentencing, they basically said, your honor, um, we recommend the guideline range. U S probation was asking for, I, I want to say it was 47 months out of the 60 and the judge slightly downward departed. He did tell me at the same time, which I, I don't know if this guy's still alive or not, but for his pro, his thought process was just ridiculous. He said, Mr. Wise, this is the most heinous crime I've ever seen. Meanwhile, I'm Googling this judge before sentencing and he sentenced people to death. And I'm thinking in my mind, well, you're not sentencing me to death, but you know what? The reality is, is my girlfriend was also indicted on this. I don't know if you read that part of it, but she went to prison with me and she was the low man on the totem pole. Like she was the re- office receptionist. All she did was answer the phones. And we thought for sure she's getting probation. She was the first person to get sentenced. So when they sentenced her and they gave her 13 months, the rest of us were like, oh my God, we are so fucked because you couldn't get any more squeaky clean than Shelly. And the fact that the judge gave her a prison sentence, everybody else knew game over. We all thought we're going to do the full 60 months. So when the judge downward departed to 42 months, it didn't feel like a victory at the time. 42 months felt like eternity. It, it felt like life is over and nothing's ever going to be the same. Um, but yes, I did not do the whole 42 months, you know, on federal time, you, you get good time. So you serve 85%, you get 54 days per year of good time in the feds. Um, and then we'll talk about it later, but there's some programming. You can also take uh, a substance abuse program, which I liked my marijuana and I enjoyed my alcohol, uh, during my, my riot days. Uh, so those if you have that and it's documented and you properly document it, which is part of what we do as our services, we'll talk about that later too. It, you can knock time off of your sentence. So I ended up only serving 13 months on 42 months. I mean, I really did about as good as you could do with the sentence I had. Wow. 13 months out of 42. That is, that's incredible. So yeah, we want to, I want to talk and I specifically want to ask you about that documentation and, and how that works. Okay. So let's talk about when people come to you you know, their biggest fear, they're about to go in prison. They've never been in prison before. What are the most common worries of someone who's about to go in? You know, most of the people that we deal with are definitely like-minded individuals. They're first time nonviolent offenders. If, if, if you're a repeat offender and you're in and out of the prison system, you're not looking up RDAP Dan on YouTube. You already know what time it is and what to expect. The people that are coming to me are lost souls. They are contemplating suicide, just as I did. The thought of suicide crossed my mind several times. So glad I didn't. I'd be I'd be really upset at myself if I killed myself. I'm <laughs> going to tell you that right now. If you're listening to this and you're, and you're facing a federal prison sentence for some kind of a nonviolent crime, don't kill yourself because you'll be really angry. And I'll, I'll tell you, they come to me and the question is, is um, I don't really know where to start. I have all these questions for my attorney. And it seems like when I sit down and start talking to my attorney, I leave with more questions than answers. What can I be doing right now that's going to make a difference in in either shortening my sentence or is there anything I can do to get probation and not go to prison? Everybody's in denial. You know, the government's making stuff up that's not true. Well, are you going to go to trial or are you going to take a plea deal? Well, my attorney's telling me I got to take a plea deal. Okay, so if you're going to take a plea deal, you know, we tell people it's it's taking acceptance responsibility for what you did. I get it. The government's out to paint a picture of you that's going to make you look like a fucking scumbag, the worst scumbag out there. But is anything of what they're saying true? Is there anything you could have done different looking back at what you did and reflecting on myself? Million things I could have done different. So when we can focus on what you did wrong and stop focusing on how the government is kind of exploding that into more than what it really is. It allows them to stay centered and going, oh, shit, I kind of did create this for myself because I wasn't focusing on consequences. Uh, so when you can start getting somebody to take the responsibility and identifying, you ask somebody like, who are your victims? Well, I got a victimless crime. 
so you live in a fucking box and nobody knows who you are. You don't have a mother, a father, a wife, a kid, an aunt, a best friend. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, these are your victims. These are people that are watching you go along with this. You think my children were not victims of what I did? Um, you can make excuses till you're blue in the face and say, you know, I did this for my family. But the reality is, is you did this for yourself. You cut corners, you know, so let's focus on what you did wrong. So when we get people to start focusing on that and coming up with a game plan of what they can start doing to be proactive, to, to be a player in their situation, start working towards mitigation aside from what the attorney is doing. We come up with an entire game plan that allows them to demonstrate themselves the day of sentencing completely different than what a judge typically sees. Uh, and that can yield amazing results such as probation. I would imagine someone who's about to go into prison and they've probably seen Shawshank Redemption and they know what Andy Dufresne's first day was like, you know, and the, the, uh, the fat guy that was crying that night that I'm not supposed to be here and that whole thing. Are you saying that none of that is accurate or is prison not as bad as everyone thinks? I know there's different levels of uh, being incarcerated as that's, well. That's what I was just going to so, say. So yeah. can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So is it as bad as people think? Um, if you're a child rapist, you killed a family of 20, you blew up a building, um, your drug cartel, prison's going to be pretty rough. You're going to go to a, a, a higher security prison. In the federal system, you have your basic levels. You have a camp status, which is as low as it can go. Camp status doesn't even have a perimeter fence. Like they, you can literally walk off the compound. Nobody would know until count time. And then, then they would consider you an escapee. Then you have a low security where you're behind a perimeter fence. I was behind a low security. Behind a perimeter fence, there's no prison politics in a low security for the most part. Some, some lows may have prison politics. And what I mean by prison politics are – uh, whites can hang out with the blacks. Uh, you can sit at the same table and watch TV. The only real outcast in a low security, and they're not going to be threatened with violence. They're just threatened with, you can't sit at my table. That's like as bad as it gets is you can't sit at the cool kid's table if you're a sex offender or if you snitched on a bunch of people. But even if you snitched in a low security prison, you're you're safe. There's There's no risk of getting hurt because the person that would be to inflict whatever punishment they think you should be dealing with, they would be the ones that would get moved out of that security and they would get bumped up to a higher security. So going to a low security where I went, uh, I was terrified. And, and I've actually got a picture and you're welcome to use this picture on the cover. So my best friend, my friend Matt's like, hey, I'm, I'm getting myself hyped up, right? I'm getting ready to self-surrender to prison. I get sentenced to 42 months. The judge gives me 60 days to get my affairs in order. And now I have to go drive myself to Coleman Federal Prison in Central Florida, uh, up, up by Ocala. And my friend Matt's like, you should go in there and make a statement. I'm like, OK, what? Like, like, hey, I'm here. He's like, no, no, you need to do something that's going to going to you're going to be on a stage. Get their attention. So he comes up with this idea. It's around Halloween time. He's like, hey, let's go to the Halloween store and let's buy a black and white prison costume. And you wear this in when you self-surrender. Like, that's what you wear into prison. And I'm drinking, thinking this is a fucking fantastic idea. So now we're driving. It's not even him in the car with me anymore. It's two other friends driving their friend, uh, Evan, and uh, I forgot the other guy's name. I can't think right. Oh, Paul, my friend, Evan and Paul. We get there and they're like, you're going to put the costume on? And I'm I'm scared now. I'm, I see the prison. I see the gates. I see the guard driving around. I was like, I don't know, man. It's like, oh, dude, you talked so much about this. We've got the video. We're going to record this. You're going to show you walking in. You got to do this. I'm like, all right, twist my arm again. I'm always that idiot that agrees to do something. So I put on the costume I'm, it's, and I'll send you the picture of it. I've got the picture of me standing in front of the prison, holding my papers in front of the prison, a little white hat on prison number, whole, the whole nine. So I walk up and there's this call box and I'm pressing the button waiting. Well, a perimeter truck drives. This guy with a shotgun drives around. He pulls up. He's like, can I help you guys? I walk up. I'm like, yeah, I'm here to self-surrender. And he goes, you're self-surrendering dressed like that. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I was drunk. Uh, I had did a bunch of Molly the night before because who's not going to – I mean, you're going to turn – what fucking moron turns themselves into prison for 42 months? I mean, just that itself is like a mind fuck. Just you're turning yourself into prison. So I'm on Molly. I'm wearing a prison costume, and the guard's like, all right, man, good luck with that. 
So they buzz me in. I walk in. My buddies are recording it and videotaping it, kind of hidden with their cameras so because you can't record on federal ground, so they're kind of pretending. They let me stand there for about five to ten minutes, and uh, I walk in the front doors. They bring me into what's called R&D, and I'm standing there, and I walk up to a desk. I give them my ID, and the guy's looking at me. He's like, have a seat right here. So I must be waiting about 15, 20 minutes. I'm trying to be cool. I'm no longer cool. I'm just like, this was a terrible idea. I like, can I reverse time? Can I go, where's the fucking Stewie time machine here? I'm, I'm not feeling this at all. I see three giants walking in the distance. I mean, this is something out of a fucking movie. They start approaching me and they get about three feet from me. And I'm like, okay, they're clearly here for me. So I stick my hands out and I'm like, you got me coppers trying to make light of the situation. Um, they did, they saw negative uh, entertainment and value with what I was saying. They saw no humor in it. They grabbed me, threw me against the wall, put my arm behind my back. When I say ripped the clothes off me, like ripped the clothes off me. This is, I felt like I was about to get raped. I mean, the clothes were ripped off. I had like stress marks across my body from where the clothes ripped off of me, threw them on the ground. And all I remember was the guy grabbing the butt of my neck. Like I was a little doll. That's how big his hands were. And he put his face right next to my face. And he says, you think this is a fucking joke? You think we're your fucking friends? And that's all I remember them saying. And I'm sitting in a holding cell for the next several hours. Well, they're drug testing me. And they're like, oh, he tested positive for, I guess the Molly had opiates in it. I tested positive for opiates. I tested positive for THC. And I sat there thinking, they're like, we should send them to the medium. And I'm just like, oh my God, the medium. Like, where am I at right now? What does that even mean? Uh, I don't, these are all terms I don't know. Uh, they sent me to general population at that point. They said, your unit is A1, go there. So they pointed in a direction that said, walk to that building. I walked to the building with no knowledge of where I was going. I walk into the building and a bunch of inmates start, start walking up to me. Where are you from? What's your name? I'm exhausted. You're like, leave me the fuck alone. I want to go to sleep, but you're in prison. So the last thing you're going to do is say any of that. So you're like, Hey, my name's Dan and I'm from South Florida. They're like, well, what'd you do? Why are you here? Typically first time nonviolent offenders that have a sentence of less than 10 years or less than, uh, yeah, less than 10 years do not go to a low, you go to a camp. Um, so when I told them what my crime was, or I didn't tell them what my crime was, I said where I was from and how long my sentence was. I'm like, well, what'd you do? All I can remember is movies you've seen where you don't talk about your crime. You're not supposed to tell people those things and you're not supposed to ask those things. So my response was, well, I don't want to talk about it. And they're like, okay. So they'd walk away. Another white guy would come up to me. I'm waiting to see like a case manager or guard or something to tell me, you know, what shitty bunk I'm going to sleep on. Uh, another inmate would walk up and be like, hey, man, what's your name? Where are you from? What'd you do? I don't want to talk about it. Um, so that happened two or three times. Finally, the first guy that asked me, He's like the leader of this pod, leader of the white boys. His name is Rick. Uh, everybody called him. Everybody called him white boy Rick. So Rick walks up to me. He goes, look, man, I'm going to be real with you. Uh, you don't look like a drug dealer. You don't look like you're in a gang. So do you fuck little kids? And I'm just like, what, what, what? I'm like, no, why? He's like, uh, you're not telling us what you did. And that's a tall tale sign. You know, when you don't talk about your crime, it's usually because you got one of those crimes that you don't want to talk about. So I'm immediately scrambling for something to show like what I did. Um, and it took me about 30 minutes to get paperwork from somebody from a correctional guard showing what my judgment committal was showing that I was in there for conspiracy to distribute. Um, once they saw what I was in for, they're like, why are you at a low? And I'm like, I don't even know what the fuck that means. Like, why am I at a low? Should I be somewhere better than this? And I had an open case, which I didn't know about. So when the feds indicted me, the state had also charged me, but the state hadn't prosecuted yet. So I, when you have an open charge, which is called a detainer, it prevents you from going to a camp, which is open custody, because when you have an open case, they don't know necessarily what your open case is. And being there's no perimeter fence, your open case could be for who knows, some crazy crime that you might go on the run and take off. So anyway, that's why they stuck me to low. So yeah, my, my first few hours were extremely stressful. I hear people say, you know, this might be, it's either going to be a great idea or it's going to make for a great story. And <laughs> that costume was definitely not a great idea. Um, hindsight, no, but it does make for a pretty, uh, fast forward, 
all those same guards came back up to me and they actually said that was fucking hilarious. Uh, we couldn't let you know at the time. We thought maybe you were completely a lunatic or you were crazy because no one's ever done something like that. And we didn't really know how to take you. Once they saw that I wasn't crazy and that I just really, you know, I've always been that person. I've always been in a, a, an attention seeking brat, um, which is probably why I have a YouTube channel. I love to hear myself talk. I love being on this podcast right now because I get to hear myself rattle. I'm sure people are going to love hearing you too. Yeah, but you know, that's, that's <laughs> just my MO. And I've learned that the hustle in me, the con artist in me, it's always going to be there. So I, I've had to found a way to use my powers for good and not use it to take advantage of people and question my morals. And is this going to cause somebody to be in a, in a better off situation than what they're currently in? So I found you can still get off on that same high, but you got to do things for the right reason. And usually everything else kind of falls in place when you, when you, when you kind of stack your, uh, your priorities in place. You've discovered your strengths and you're channeling to the right direction. So that's, that's good. Is it, do you think when people are before they actually do get sentenced and they think, okay, I got to go before the judge, is it safe to assume that the judge is going to go easier on you if you don't have any past criminal history? Well, sure. It's not, I mean, obviously if you've continually made mistakes, that's not going to help you. You know, if somebody says that to me, I've never been in trouble before. Do you think that's going to help me? It's like, why would you ask such a, and I'm not saying this to you. I'm saying this to my clients. Quit, quit looking for, for the, the, the attaboy, the judge is going to, he's, he's going to give you a pat on the back and say, don't do it again. Well, sure. Asshole. It's going to look a little bit better for you because you didn't murder anybody prior to this. You're going to have a better conduct. You're going to have a better offense level, but this isn't like the first time there's nothing special about you. And this is what I tell every client. There's absolutely nothing special about you. The fact that you're a first time nonviolent offender, the fact that you're a father of 300 kids, the fact that you go to church every day, the fact that you bring food to the homeless and you climb up trees and you, and you get cats out for the firefighters isn't going to mean a fucking thing because you still did what you did. And what you did has a guideline range. What you did has an offense level associated to it that carries guidelines. Your guidelines are, are basically what the sentencing is going to be uh, comprised of is your guidelines, your past criminal history, all of these things. So the fact that you have no past, no criminal history, yes, that helps you, but that doesn't mean kick back and relax. There's a million people that look and sound just like you. So how do you create a different opportunity for yourself to create the opportunity for the judge to go, you know what? I give probation or home confinement maybe once a year and you're the type of person I want to give it to. How do we invoke that type of reaction out of the judge? That's what we're going after. And we have a whole method of, of how we do that. All right. Because when you're standing there, you're not going to, you don't have time to create rapport or charm this judge because he sees people in and out, you know, all day and they all look just like you do. Yep. And, and everyone he sees wants the, wants the easy sentence. Yep. Too. Absolutely. And getting people to understand that is rocket science sometimes. What if you, what if somebody says, man, I don't, I'm not going to make it in prison. I have never been, I've never even been in a fight. How am I going to, how am I going to do this? Sure. The, and I, and I immediately tell people, look, stop, with all the bullshit, you are not going to that type of prison. You know what your day is going to consist of? And I know it's hard to fathom that right now, me telling it to you, but your day is going to consist of you walking a track. It's going to consist of you working a job, probably not that serious of a job. It's going to comprise of you going to classes all day. Maybe you're on a softball team. You're going to be walking a half mile track. There's going to be flat screen TVs everywhere. There's going to be a billiard room where you're going to go play pool. There's going to be a movie room. There's a commissary where you can order ice cream on the weekends. There's no, you're never going to hear a cell close behind you. There's no cells. There's no bars. You're in a dorm or you're in a cubicle. It's, it's a nonviolent environment. Most of the people that are there are either white collar or drug offenders of, of nonviolent crimes. It's the people that are just like you. You'll probably make, I made such good friends with some of the guys that I was in prison with that to this day, uh, I still communicate with some of them and I'm, we have this kinship. It's very similar to military. Uh, everybody I talk to that's been through a military experience. I don't know if you're military. Um, I'm not, but anybody that's been through a military experience we have a lot of the same, it's, it's regimen. You get up, eat your breakfast, you go do, you go to class, you go work out together, you go watch things. I mean, it's, it, it was actually, 
I made the best of my time. And that's why you asked me early on in this conversation. You said, uh, how has this changed you? And has it changed you for the good or for the worse? You can choose one of two directions. You can choose to go into prison and go, this isn't fair. I don't belong here. Uh, why me? Um, you can come up with a million reasons. Somebody told on me. You know, Yes, somebody probably told on you. Or you probably told on somebody else. It's one of the two, right? Most people in prison that talk about, I would never tell. They're the ones that tell. I'll tell you that right now. But you're there. Make the best of it. Hang out with good people, like-minded individuals. Uh, I started reading books in there. I've never read the Bible before. I read the Bible in prison. I found God in prison. And it's such a it, it, it's such a funny thing to say because you hear people say it all the time. Oh, I found God in prison. It's so cliche. The reality is you're at an all-time low. So you seek, you finally, you finally give in to serenity is what it really is. And you realize like my best fucking decisions and my best choices landed me right here. Clearly, I'm no one to give advice to anybody until I figure out and clean up my own house. You know, get your own house in order before you start giving somebody else advice. You can't be a father to your kids. You can't be a husband to your wife. You can't do anything for anybody else until you fix your own shit. Then you can start giving back to people. So I used my time to realize who I was and redefine and recalculate what mattered to me. And I came out a completely different person, but you got to use maintenance. If I don't maintain what I learned, I could very easily go back to the scumbag person I was in the past. You ever watch the TV show, The Office? Of course. When you're describing prison, it reminds me of the one episode where the guy that, you know, they hired the guy who had been in prison and the way he described it, it sounded like it was better to be in prison than to be in the office where they were working. You know, you're talking about TVs and billiard rooms and, uh, you know, all that stuff. Uh, Life was great. Uh, a- I, I had zero worries. I look, I went into prison, weighed almost 300 and something pounds. I came out of prison, 180 in shape, uh, educated. I was just witty. I was, I was on point. I was ready to take on the world. And I never would have had this moment of clarity if I had not taken this, this short break in life. Thank God it was only 13 months. But even if I had done the whole 42 months, I met guys in there that are like, what's your sentence? And I'm like, 42 months. And they've already been down 15, 20 years, working their way down to a low, still got 10 years left. And they're like, oh man, you're still going to be shitting McDonald's when you get out of here. It was just such a like, they put it into perspective. Like you don't go in there complain about your short sentence. I know when you tell somebody when you, when you don't see it, it's going from hot water to cold water. Granted. Yes. It's easy to say, Oh, you only got like, if somebody were to tell, like, I get clients that are like, I got sentenced to 60 days. My initial reaction is one to say, Oh God, why are you even calling me? But I get it. You only know what you know. You know, you never dealt with that's, that's your new glass ceiling. And until you poke through that glass ceiling, you don't know that you can go higher and higher. So constantly challenging myself with questions, asking myself questions, making decisions, and focusing on consequences. When you use those three things in conjunction, you are a force that nobody can stop. Uh, So that's how I built my business. All right. I got a few questions from listeners. I asked this in my Facebook group for the podcast, what questions people would like to ask you when I was talking with you. And Marcy had a question. She Her her job is she delivers supplies to prisons. And so she was wondering if she strikes up a conversation with an inmate while she happens to be there delivering something, does that encourage them? Or does it bring sadness knowing that she's going to leave and they're still stuck there? Uh. Definitely, I would encourage any human interaction. However, you know, a lot of inmates will look for uh, weaknesses. They'll look for ways to get you to do things for them, favors. And it could start off with something little, little, like ask, I mean, turn on a light when the light's not supposed to be on. I mean, anything. There's nothing wrong with giving somebody human courtesy. As long as you have a boundary in a line that you're not willing to cross. If an inmate wants to go, hey, how are you doing? Great. Uh, if they start talking about your family or start bringing up anything personal, you got to draw the line. Doesn't mean you have to be rude or get, you know be a bitch to them or or anything that's you know gonna gonna adversely affect them. But you can easily draw a line and say, yeah, you just change the subject. But I would definitely encourage making people feel because look, 
these people are going to get out. These aren't lifers, right? So if they're constantly beat down and told, treated like an animal, when they get out, they might have that animal mentality. So I think uh, that's a great question. Definitely give them the respect of being a human being. Tim asks, how should an inmate interact with the guards? Like be friendly or just avoid conversation or what's that dynamic? What, what should that look like? Uh, interacting with a guard in an open setting is fine. Like there were some guards that were pretty relaxed and pretty chill that around other people, you could be like, Hey, you know, talk about sports. The problem was when you would see the inmates sneak away and they'd go talk to the guards one-on-one behind closed doors, you feel like, Oh, this guy's little office pet or teacher's pet, or he's going to tell on people he's doing things to get, you know, then you start looking like a weasel. And you got to be careful because people see you doing that. It could have, no one's going to trust you. If they see you in there hanging out with a guard in the prison environment, technically correctional staff is the enemy, right? And you're the opposition, uh, not to say who's right or wrong, but that's just the mentality. They're there to keep everybody safe. You're there as an inmate. And I've seen plenty of inmates trying to game on guards and get over on guards and put guards into a situation where they could hold something over their head to extort them. Uh, to get things out of them. And I've also seen guards who were just overly aggressive with inmates. So my personal perception on that was I was nice and respectful. If a guard did something that I didn't like, or he abused his power with me, I immediately realized, you know what, this is your world for the short time that I'm here. Have at it. I'm not going to stand and hold my ground to prove a point and go spend time in solitary confinement or lose good time or get kicked out of a program because I wanted to prove myself. It wasn't that kind of a prison. So you have to be very alert to what you're doing and don't allow yourself to get too friendly with the guards because that could appear very poorly with your inmate staff or with your inmate population. And that's not going to go unnoticed. People are going to notice. Correct. That. Okay. All right. And one more. Jennifer asks, how extensive are the resources available to inmates, uh, such as ministry opportunities, continuing education, that kind of thing? Again, that's going to depend where you go, state versus feds. Where I was at Coleman Federal Prison, I'm a firm believer that if, if you want to educate yourself in prison, you will find a way to take advantage of the resources. Um, I've seen a lot of guys come out of prison and they'll say, oh, prison didn't do anything to help me you really didn't do anything to help yourself while you were in prison. The resources are there. They're not there for everybody. If, if you're an average able person that is able to like kind of do a little for yourself, then yeah, the resources are there. If you've never held a job before and you can't spell resources, aren't there for you. It's not, you're going to get out. No one's really going to help you. There's not a lot of assistance out there. They say there is, there's a lot of money being spent on it. But in the reality is I saw guys in the federal halfway house trying to find jobs that couldn't even get help with a resume. I mean, they were, they're so lost and you wonder why the revolving door brings them right back in. All they ever knew was a life of crime and no one's giving them the ability. They don't know where to turn for the help because it's not, it's not like you go to one place and get everything you need. It's like, they send you here, they send you here. You're trying to find money for a bus pass. It's, it's a nightmare. Before you know it, you're like, fuck it, I'm robbing a convenience store. I'd rather spend my time in prison than deal with the bullshit world. World's a rough place. The struggle is very real. Uh, We feel that every day, especially with what's going on right now with the pandemic. But I feel like I'm prepped for this. This stay in your house. eh, Okay. I walk around. I listen to music. It's it's no worse than prison. (laughs) All right. Let's talk about how someone can help themselves. Either before they go in, you know, most, mostly that's what it is, right? Before they go in, how, how can they kind of lay the foundation to minimize their time inside? Yeah. So somebody that's in trouble right now and they're, think, they're thinking to themselves like, look, I, I, I'm under indictment. I'm under federal investigation. What should I be doing? Accountability is going to be number one, taking responsibility for what it is that you did do. And realizing by taking responsibility, the government is not going to be your friend. They're not going to go, oh, we're going to let you off. Uh, They're going to paint a picture and you're going to have to be okay with that. But what you do on your own mitigating factors, how you're preparing personal narrative, probably one of the number one things that we talk about. Personal narrative is a letter that you're going to be writing that the judge is going to read at your sentencing. So understanding how to properly develop a personal narrative 
is huge because you don't want to go in there just blaming everybody else. You don't want to go in there and say, I did this because my father didn't hug me enough as a kid or, you know, I was addicted to drugs. You have to own what it is that you did if you're taking a plea deal. Character reference letters that your friends and family are going to write on your behalf, same thing. You can't have your mother and your best friend saying, he's a really good guy. Please give him a second chance, Your Honor. He doesn't deserve to go to prison. He's my baby boy. You know, they have to, you have to be able to explain to your friends and family that I did this and you're one of my victims. And if you're going to write a letter on my behalf, you need to be hard on me. You need to, you need to tell the court how what I did is also affecting you. But what I'm doing now to better myself and the better choices that I'm making and the level of accountability that I'm taking for this. I also want you to talk about that on changes that you've seen, knowing what programs might be available. If you use drugs, one of the fatal things that we hear a lot of defendants tell us is my attorney didn't tell me to bring up my substance abuse during my pre-sentence interview. When the, when the probation officer asked me if I drank or used drugs, I lied and said, no, because I thought it was going to make me look bad if I was honest about that. I thought they would give me a rougher sentence or maybe they would revoke my bond. So I lied and said I had no substance abuse problems. Well, when you tell that probation officer you have no substance abuse problems and that gets documented into what's called a pre-sentence investigation, and now you're in prison, you find out, well, shit, there's an RDAP program, Residential Drug Addiction Program, that if you qualify for this program, it can reduce your sentence after the fact by 12 months. When they look at your PSR and you're like, nope, I don't have any issues. They're going to go, uh, it says no in your PSR. I don't care what you're saying now. You don't qualify. So knowing all of these things ahead of time, how to properly prepare the steps that you can take to mitigate in addition to what your attorney is doing can complement the situation. So it's really not waiting to the last minute to take it serious. Start taking it serious right away. You're going to feel pain. You're going to feel anguish. It's going to be hard, but change nothing easy or nothing, nothing worth value is ever easy. Change is a process. It's not an immediate event. So you have to allow yourself to feel the pain in order to make the change. I just put that up just now, by the way, I've never said that before. <laughs> you, you better write that down. That's a good thing. To... <laughs> okay. So somebody comes to you and they don't have any drug problem. They aren't an alcoholic. Is it time to start drinking? No, not going to do you any good. Um, RDAP is all based on prior to your indictment. So once you're indicted, you might pick up a heroin addiction because you're freaking out. doesn't matter. Uh, it's all prior to indictment, 12 months prior to the indictment. After you're indicted, after the arrest, you could become an addict and it's not going to help you. Would they know drug problem because of pre prior convictions for drugs or how would they verify that? Truth be told, and I, and I, and I do not advocate this at all because- there's only a certain amount of people. They only have space for a certain amount of people to take these programs and if you have guys going in and making up lies just to get in the, pro there's actually a prison consulting group called RDAP law consultants who is just getting sentenced right now for doing just that educating, we're ed educating, manipulating people into lying to the probation officer about having a drug problem when they didn't have one in order to get the year off. You're not going to fake your way through RDAP first off. The RDAP coordinators that are in there, the, the DAP coordinators, the substance abuse professionals that have seen a million people just like you come and go. If you walk in there and you're not really somebody that's used anything, drinking, marijuana, and you can't, your, your backstory, you live in this unit for 10 months. You live with these people for, for 10 months. You cannot be uh, an actor 24 seven. The real you is going to come out and you're going to get kicked out of the program and you're not going to get any time off. So if you're one of those people that you just described that doesn't have a substance abuse problem, we focus on personal narratives, reference letters, how we're engaging with the community. If you're a doctor getting ready to go to prison and you've already taken your plea deal, we bring you to colleges. We have you speak to pre-med students about, you know, just like they're sitting there right now, at some point, they're going to be in a situation where someone's going to go, you know, we can double bill these insurance, you know. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid, we can make, you know, a couple million dollars off of this when you're already making high six figures, mid six figures a year, that greed factor kicks in, or you don't know how to fucking say no to somebody because you're like, well, okay, I guess I don't want any conflict. And now you're sitting in prison for some bad choices. Well, we have these doctors getting ready to go to prison or pharmacists getting ready to go to prison or attorneys getting ready to go to prison, speaking to the younger version of them saying, I hope this connects with you because there's going to be a time in your life where you're going to have a fork in the road and you can go left, sounds easy, or you can take the hard way and take the stairs instead of the elevator, 
but you're going to be safe. And hoping that they hear that cautionary tale prevents them from making the same poor choices. So these things can it can inflate a judge's decision 10 times over because now not only are you giving back to your community, but you're potentially stopping somebody from making the same poor choices that you make. There's nothing more giving back. Going and donating your time at Salvation Army, that's great. Nobody knows why you're doing it. Practicing humility is the key. Making people aware of what you did really allows you to own the shit that you caused. Right. Because I, you know, for a fact that some of those, you know, when you're talking to those uh, med students, some of the, they're going to come to a point where they have that decision to make and they can go left or they can go right. Yep. And you just got to think, they're going to think, oh, wait a minute, that guy I heard talk back when I was in school, I, I better think twice about this. My co-defendant, Dr. Gossett, he got the same sentence as me, 42 months. This was a mid-level. He was a very successful doctor who was in his getting ready to retire, had a few houses in Georgia. And he is now a lawnmower operator because he's too old to go back and do anything. He lost his uh, his license to practice. They took everything from him. His wife left him. And he's very bitter, blames the government, never accepted the responsibility. And he's literally cutting grass to this day. And I, I could not make this up if I wanted to. You have to be aware of what you're doing. I know you've talked about the the halfway house thing where you you want to you want to get out of I guess that's talking about you get out of actual prison and you want to have additional halfway house time which kind of replaces your prison time or can yes. you can you talk about how the halfway house program works or what that process is Yep so whatever your sentence is 24 months 36 months whatever it is um you can do a portion of your prison sentence. Well, as long as your crime allows you, meaning you have like a non, if your crime is incredibly violent or you like raped kids or something like that, you're not going to go any halfway house. But for the rest of us who didn't murder a kid or, you know, mess with kids, we can go to a federal halfway house, meaning you can do a portion of your sentence in the halfway house and you can do a portion of your sentence on home confinement. So it's not like you're going to serve your time and halfway house. It's all combined. So technically, you can do the last 12 months of your sentence in a halfway house. I could not wait to go to the halfway house. I was so excited. I'm like, this halfway house is going to be, it's got to be a step above prison, right? You're thinking, well, prison's like this. Halfway house is probably going to be this much better. And then home confinement is going to be like the final step before freedom. Halfway house. So I was very fortunate. Well, I thought I was very fortunate when they gave me 11 months halfway house out of my 42 month sentence. You take away the good time, which is, uh, well, actually, you, I qualified for RDAP. So you get rid of my good time, six months. I did RDAP. They took off a year. And then my last 11 months of my prison sentence, they said, you've been so good, Mr. Wise. We're going to send you to the halfway house in uh, Spokane, Washington, because I transferred from Florida to Washington. And I'm like, this is fucking great. I'm going to be in the halfway house. I can go eat regular food. I can go see my girlfriend. I can get laid. I have all of these thoughts of these things that I could do. I get to the halfway house and I pull up. They fly me there. I get on a plane. Shelly picks me up. My girlfriend picks me up at the airport, takes me to the halfway house. And I'm like, I, I think we're at the wrong place. We're in the most dangerous part of town. This building looks like it should be condemned. It looked like maybe it used to be a mechanics workshop. And I see these guys standing outside. I'm like, hey, uh, I'm looking for a halfway house. I have a garbage bag full of clothes. I'm like, yep, you're at the right place. This place was pure shit hole. Nothing, no amenities, nothing to do. Where I came from was fucking club fed. This was horrible. And you're thinking, hey, can I go back? Right? <laughs> I, I'm not lying to you. I asked, can I go back? I did not cry one time while I was in prison. A couple of times I might've missed my kids. They sent me a nice card. I shed a tear. I didn't cry in prison over like, oh my God, I can't do this. My first night in the halfway house, when I finally got into my bunk, I sobbed like a bitch. I was so like, oh my God, I can't do 11 months of this. Well, what the fuck am I going to do? This is the worst place I've ever been. It wasn't scary. It was just nothing. There's no windows. It was dark. It was gloomy. It was the showers were disgusting. I was just like, send me back to prison. Uh, but you you uh, you adapt, man. You find a way to make it work. And I got a job. I was working. They liked me there because I wasn't causing any problems. And there were a bunch of little pricks that worked there, a bunch of young kids that 
you know, that had jobs. They weren't cops. They were just, they called them resident monitors. So I just let them run their, I never, I never talked back. And because of that, they didn't mess with me. And I, I was in and out of there as much as I, I was only there for work. I'd go home on the weekends. I ended up getting a pretty sweet job where I was working. And that's how I started my YouTube channel. I worked for a friend who got me in office. He put me on the schedule from eight in the morning to nine o'clock at night, even though I was done working at three, but he would keep me on the schedule till nine. And then I would just take my paycheck and give it back to him. But from three to nine, I would make YouTube videos about my experience in prison. And that's how the YouTube channel started from Federal Halfway House. So at the halfway house, I'm, obviously there are rules. You probably have a, had a curfew, and not even a curfew. you were you're not going nowhere unless you're going to work. It's not like leave at eight, come back at this time. It's like oh, you don't work today, you're in the halfway house. Oh, you have to go to work today. Well, where do you work? How long does it take you to get there? Okay, it takes you thirty minutes to get there. We'll give you forty five minutes to get there. They give you just enough time to get to two. You want to go clothes shopping? You need to go buy some. Uh, if you're a female, you need to buy feminine products. You need a haircut. You got to let them know a week ahead of time where you need to go. And if they approve it, they give you just enough time to get there and get back. If you deviate, if you stop and get a cheeseburger, you're done. You're toast. You're going back to prison. I violated my halfway house and they sent me back to county jail for 27 days. Torture, pure torture for smacking a vending machine that ate my money and getting my chips out of the vending machine. They said theft of a vending machine and tried to violate me. And if I would have been found guilty of that, I would have lost my RDAP. They would have taken the entire year back and I would have gone back to prison sitting in county jail. Wow. What a simple, silly little thing. And what a big effect it could have had. Important decisions in the real world don't matter. You spit on a sidewalk, somebody cuts you off and you say, fuck you. Those things don't matter. In in, In a reality world that we're in right now where people are running on high emotions, that's why people tell you it, it, prison's not that bad because there's a different level of respect in there. You don't just assume you're going to get away with everything. And until you're free and clear, you're under a microscope. Any little thing you do wrong can have catastrophic consequences until you're free and clear, which I am now. Right. And it, it's it's another analogy to the military environment. You know, it's the same thing. Everything you do is is monitored and and everything has consequences there as well, right? Yep. Very it's similar. Same, same. Tell us about your service. You, uh, how did you get started counseling people who were about, I mean, obviously your experience qualifies you for this, <laughs> but what made you decide to, to go into that? You know, I wish I could say this was like some master plan that I had that I came up with while I was in prison, but not at all. Um, so the first video that you referenced that I did before I went to prison, where I was kind of just talking to friends and family through YouTube channel. I went to prison, did my time. Obviously, it wasn't that bad, not nearly what I thought it was going to be. Got out of prison, living in the federal halfway house, finally get access to an email where I can check my my emails. And I, I see YouTube, 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 YouTube. I see all these comments from YouTube. I'm like, what YouTube? Why am I getting emails from YouTube? So I'm reading it and I see comments from that video that I recorded that I completely forgot about. And every comment was something along the lines of, Hey, Dan, I watched your video. I hope you're out of prison right now. I'm getting ready to go through the same thing you're going through. If you have any advice for me, I would love to hear from you. Every comment was pretty much along that context. So while I had all this free time at work, because my awesome buddy who fit food fresh, who gave me this job, I would start answering these questions on my YouTube channel, just talking about, oh, you should do this. You should do that. Well, after I did maybe six or seven videos, it started getting a little bit of a following. Um, That video that you saw before I even got out of prison had maybe 20 or 30,000 views, which for me was like viral. Uh, That was huge for me. So I had a little bit of traction coming out. When I started making these response videos, immediately people were like, oh my God, you you made it out. You don't seem crazy. You, You don't have a bunch of tattoos. You don't look, you actually look pretty, you actually look better coming out than going in. Um, And they asked me, what I did and how I shortened my sentence. So I was just talking about my experience. And then criminal defense attorneys started calling me saying, Hey, I don't know who you are, but my client keeps telling me I need to reach out to you. And I'd get these calls and what do you charge? And I'm like, what do I charge? I, you can charge for this. I was like, I don't know. Um, here's my PayPal. Send me a donation, whatever you send me. I'm fine with that. Some people send me 20 bucks. Some people send me a couple hundred bucks and I would get on the phone and just do a light education service. 
Uh, another prison consultant approached me, a much larger one who was in the industry, and said, hey, we would like you to be a part of our brand. You have an approach that we don't have. You're the everyday guy that people relate to where we only can hit the white collar guys. Uh, and I'm like, great, let's do it. Let's let's make some money together. But then after like a week into it, they're like, eh, you need to stop giving everything away. You need to stop telling people how they can shorten their sentence until they pay. And I'm a big believer of, I can tell you how to build a car. I can tell you how to bake the fucking pie. It doesn't mean you're going to go do it. You know, if you're that dedicated, you're going to figure it out. So there's no, I'm not giving away any, any secret. You still need us. You don't know where to navigate. You don't know how to end. So I didn't, I didn't believe them. They told me I'll never make it on my own because I'm not the white collar. I don't, I don't attract the white collar guys. I'm never going to be taken serious. And without their guidance, I'm just going to be some other schmuck that got out of prison. And I said, you know, I could have believed that if I wanted to, but I've always been a believer. When you tell me I can't do something, I go find a way. And I slowly started developing a team of, I ended up hiring a, a life coach that understands what we do. I hired professional writers that learned the system from what's the best approach to take when you're writing a personal narrative and a character reference letter. So instead of just having you write your letter, we do an interview process. You, you'll answer a million questions. And based on your answers, we now know who you are. We built a, a physical profile on you. We can now build your narrative. We hired a chemical dependency professional to evaluate you if you did have a substance abuse problem, but there was no track record. Like you said, maybe you were never arrested. Maybe you drank every day, but you never really told anybody about it. Uh, we helped bring this out through a substance abuse timeline. We brought in a team of professionals who make me look like a fucking rock star because without them, I'm really nothing. And we we use systems that are out there. I come from the world of sales with call centers and CRMs. And I've learned how to use this technology that's already existing to manifest into this industry, which is really non-existent. And through YouTube, the power of YouTube allowed me to catapult and bypass all of these prison consultants because where they were charging everybody 15, 20 grand, we were coming in and charging people three or four grand and doing way more services. And once the word got out that RDAP Dan, which is the name that got coined for me in YouTube, once they realized that RDAP Dan is not some fly by night and he actually knows what he's talking about and he's giving us the same value that somebody else is charging me 15 grand for without condescending me and making me feel like if I'm anything other than a white collar guy, I'm not worthy of your service. So now we have billionaires hiring us and then we have guys that are working at Walmart hiring us. So we've found a way to make it work. And in the process, I was able to build for me, it's an empire to be able to generate uh, seven figures a year doing something that you love. Now, I didn't say I make seven figures a year, generate seven figures a year, just to be clear. Revenue is not the same as net. I know. It's not. Everybody <laughs> understands that. Um, however, we've been very fortunate because you can't make everybody happy. Sure, you've got people out there that get better results than other people. We don't overpromise. Don't under deliver. We give you realistic expectations. And the end of the day, if you use the service that we have, you're going to be much better off with us than without us. And that's what our clients will tell you that actually put in the time and effort. Um, we have happy clients. We have great clients. We have clients. Uh, I don't have it in front of me right now. Cli clients sent me this mask. You know, they make these masks. You know, these people that take their time to send me gifts in the mail because we've connected. Uh, my kids get involved. My kids come on YouTube and talk about what it was like from the perspective of a child going through this. What do they wish that I had done differently? Being honest with them when I wasn't honest with them about what I did, uh, how that affected them in school, getting these real life perspectives of I'm not just going to pretend to be like your attorney. I'm not going to pretend to be all super professional. We're going to get real. We're going to talk about what you did and we're going to come up with a solution and we're going to make you better. It's really that simple. And I'm blessed to be able to do this for a career. Yeah. And I love it. It, you know, I, I always say the best businesses or the most successful businesses are the ones that solve a problem for someone. And obviously that's what you're doing. And I love the fact that you, man, I, I, I think I first found you on Facebook, but then I knew you had a YouTube channel and I said, okay, well, before I talk to Dan, I'm going to go, I'll go watch his videos and, you know, get an idea what, you know, what he's, what he says I went on your YouTube channel and man, you've got hundreds. How many videos do you actually have on there? Do you know? 
I don't know. It's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of four. I mean, it's, it, for a YouTuber, I've got maybe four. I I think I'm a pretty fucking cool YouTuber. I've got four or 500 videos. My license plate says RDAP Dan. I'm kind of conceited when it comes to my YouTube channel because I think it's really <laughs> cool that you can yeah like that. But yeah, I've, I've got a few hundred videos. Definitely. I was going to go in and watch all your videos, but you know, I, obviously I didn't watch all of them. Um, but pretty I, I, you're not going to prison. I have kind of the same concept because my, my primary business is computers. And so I do computer repair. Uh, you know, I remote into people's computers all over the country and fix things, stuff like that. But yet I've been doing a, a computer blog and podcast for many years. And every one of those blog and podcasts and, um, and articles is teaching people how to work, how to use their computer, how to fix things, stuff like that. And logic says, man, you, you're giving it all away. But, you know, people look at that, they read it and they think, okay, yeah, but can you just do it for me? <laughs> that's, you know, that's, that's, the, it, that's the thing. But yet they come to you and they know you're real because you're, you know, you're providing all this information. And that's what it just, it, it's obviously, it's very similar because you're telling people, here's what you got to do. But yet, but yet, you know, they're still going to come and, and hire you. Is that, you, you mentioned a fee of three or $4,000. Is that a typical price or what, what are your rates? Our entry level packages, and God, if you asked me this three years ago, it was like nine ninety five. And when people are like, "Oh, you charge so much more now than what you charged then," it's like, yes, but then we didn't have licensed chemical dependencies on staff. We didn't have a certified life coach. We didn't have an attorney that worked with us. It was just me and my knowledge. Now it's me and my crew. So now our base price is probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of like between thirty five hundred and 5,000. And that can range up to somebody that really needs like some, some hand holding. I would say the most expensive our service would ever be at a high end would be about 10 grand. And I know that sounds ridiculous because if you would ever would have told me I was charging 10 grand for this, I would have told you that run for your life because you're getting ripped off. That's what I would have said. But I know what we do and I know what you get for 10 grand and it's God damn it. It really does make a difference. And you know it's good because someone that uses your service pays the pays your price, and then when they get out of prison, they're going to say, "Man, I'm sure glad I I forked over that money because I'd still be sitting there." Do interviews. We've had people that have gone in, come out, and do interviews with us about you know, hey, Dan didn't leave my side. He didn't stop taking my calls. He kept in contact with me while I was in prison. Uh, it's a two way street. You're not going to hire me. And then just go radio silent and think that I'm going to be like an ex-girlfriend texting you every five minutes, bugging you. What are you doing? What are you doing? If you're not going to be proactive and you give me some money, you might be wasting your money because it's a two-way street. You got to stay engaged. Sure, we're going to send you how are you doing emails from time to time. But if you're not checking in, you're not engaging with the service. You, you can't pay somebody to do something. There's no magic wand. I'm not giving you the choice of a red pill or I'm giving you one pill. Here's the pill you're going to eat. And if you don't eat this pill, you're not going to get the work that you need to get. You have to take it serious. This isn't something that's going to fix itself with money. It takes hard work and dedication from your part. No one's going to take your situation more serious than you. If you're undermining and you're relaxing, guess what? You're going to get an outcome that's going to be a result of the action and the process that you put into it. What's the most unusual case you've had? The toughest cases I get are, uh, well, I had one guy who his name is, it's actually a, a national case. You can Google it. His name is Dr. Smithers. Um, he was a guy, he was a doctor, very similar, I, I, except I was not a doctor, but same situation, pain clinic guy, uh, got indicted for it. They offered him a plea deal. His count was much higher than mine. So I think they offered him a plea deal of seven years or 10 years and he wouldn't take it, wouldn't take it, got sentenced to 40 some odd years because he refused to take a plea deal, hired us after the fact because I work with a, a professional who does a legal, a legal professional, legal consultant who specializes in when you want to, when you're going to fight your case after the fact, when you're going to do any type of motions, if your attorney, a 2255 for ineffective counsel. And this guy just his own worst enemy. Um, there's those cases where people just can't take responsibility no matter what, because any amount of prison time sounds like too much. Those are bad clients to take. I try to typically stay away from those. And then we do work with sex offenders. A lot of people give me shit. 
They're like, you have kids. How the fuck can you work with a sex offender? It's like, look, most sex offenders, I'm not going to say all, most, when you talk about sex offenders, you're dealing with somebody with, with a broken mind. You're dealing with somebody that has, has an illness. That in the reality is if you if if you pull away what it is, it's no different than somebody that's got a drug addiction, nobody has a substance abuse addiction, a porn addiction, whatever the addiction is, they're addicted to this. And the common thing that I hear from all of them is they hate it. They hate that they do it. They'll do it, they'll look at porn or something, they'll look at whatever they look at in the internet. And then the minute they do it, they feel horrible, they delete it. I'm never gonna do it again. And that compulsion resurfaces. What people don't look at is the human nature behind that, that these people also have mothers and fathers. So when we take these cases on, usually it's the mother or the father hiring us because there's nobody they can talk to. Nobody relates to what they're going through. So my job is not to go, what your kid did is not that bad. My job is to say, he's still your son and he's going to get out of prison at some point. So we can either pretend like this doesn't exist and we can send him off to the island and he's going to be released and we pretend like he's the worst person in the world or we identify what he can do to better himself because if we don't, next time he commits the crime and you're that asshole that wants to just pretend like he doesn't exist, well, next time it's your kid or it's my kid. So we can either be a part of the problem or part of the solution. So that's probably the toughest ones that I talk about openly because it brings a lot of heat my way. I've had death threats. I've had people send me stuff in the mail telling me I must be uh, undercover chomo, which is term for child molester, because I have compassion for them. I don't have compassion for the crime. I'm not condoning what they did. I think it's a heinous crime. The worst crime you can ever commit is something against a child who is an innocent person. However, I have to look at the human nature of it and what's causing you to do this. How can we stop you from doing it in the future? Because they're not going to lock you up forever. You're going to get released back into society. So that is always a very, very tough battle to win with uh, the peanut gallery. Wow. Yeah. This has been really fascinating. Is there any part of this that other people ask you about that I haven't asked about that you want to, that you'd want to talk about? No, I would say you, you're probably up in the uh, top enchilada of people that have actually conducted a a good amount of questions. I would say you're well rounded. Very, <laughs> I'd give you a high good. five. I, I I try to do my research. No, you did a great job. No, seriously, I, I've done these interviews before where it's like I feel like I'm fucking interviewing myself. It's like just just go away. I'll just talk to myself. I can do better. Uh, no, you've done it. You've done a really good job. I wish everybody had much that much time to research the the curiosity that people have. Cause that's, that's the taboo is, is what's it like. Um, that's what it is. Yeah. Cause people have, pe- people have never been there. You know, the most of the majority of people have never been in prison. You see what it's, what you, it's supposed to be like on movies and, but it's not really like that. And it's like everyone's worst fear. What if I, what if I ever did something stupid and ended up going to prison and uh, for, you know, they all they do is they find you and then there's hope. No, that's that's it. kind of what you give people, right? You give them hope, realistic hope. We give them hope, not a dream. You know, we give them a, we give them a real. We we help them sleep better at night, manage the expectation, manage the anxiety. We're not going to get rid of your anxiety. You know, we're going to help you manage it so it doesn't build up. Give you measurable steps you can take to reduce it so you can manage it, but it's still going to be there. That's yeah, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, I would just love people to come check out my YouTube channel over at RDAP Dan or. You know, anywhere RDAP Dan, Federal Prison Time Consulting is the company. But yeah, come come check us out, man. We're not just here to sell you something. We hope we can educate you and maybe we'll be on your podcast next. <laughs> maybe. I've got, uh, I know you, uh, obviously your YouTube, you're on all the socials, you know, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all those, I assume. LinkedIn, LinkedIn is where we're really, we're starting to excel big on LinkedIn, more in the, uh, in the professional field. Ah, oh, yeah. That... I don't use LinkedIn much myself, but come on. That's where all the adults are. All the adults are hanging out in LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. But Join nobody on LinkedIn. I'm looking for people with crazy stories and LinkedIn yeah. isn't usually where you'd tell a story like that. Probably so, not. all right. Well, Dan, thanks for your time. I appreciate you coming on here. And, um, it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing you're doing. It's awesome. Scott, I appreciate it, man. Anytime you let me know, I'd love to come back and do it again. <laughs>